Hi, Wax here, back in my basement with Anakin Starkiller? This is gonna be wicked. <laughs>
yeah, that is gonna replicate the original. I wanted to do the plastic and metal construction because I thought it was a little bit closer to the original. That actually uh, sands very smooth too. Very yeah. easy to sand. If you see, uh, this is a box that I've done a little bit of work on. Um, I painted this, uh, the gray section, with uh, Tamiya uh, German gray, which I think is a pretty good approximation. If you wanted something a little bit shinier or rich to match with the richness of the new sloth ca um, cards, you might try Tamiya Gunship Cray. It's a pretty similar color. So what I did was I mask off, um, I mask off the top rail because it is white styrene. I didn't on the know original. that. Yeah, yeah I've that. seen some pictures that, that show that, and then I mask off the inside so that there's no paint on the in interior. Uh, stopping the box from fitting inside the aluminum sleeve um, and then just run it over with a rattle can uh, oh, to create that. This is Sloss card, um, which I didn't have when I designed it. I just had the numbers that Sloth was giving me, so I was super overjoyed when <laughs> it, it worked fit. Perfect. Yeah, I know. I know. That's the last thing you want, right? When you get the parts and then find that they don't actually go together. Quick question, Dan. Can you be bought on Amazon? Uh, Where'd you get the, the paint? I got them at a local hobby shop, All right. but I do believe so because some hobby shops you'll go to don't have Tamiya yep. stuff. Um, and I'm pretty sure they have Tamiya stuff internationally too. Yep. Um, I remember seeing that at a British, British shop. So in order to affix the Yuma box, um, it comes in two parts, right? This is the main Yuma control box, and this is the side switch, um, which was glued onto, uh, onto the control box when it was a fighting hero for the Yuma scenes. Um, what I've done is I've designed a slot here and put in a slot or a piece to slide into that slot here so that you can um, use this as a control switch um, when you build uh, the Yuma control box and if you want to build a fighting hero that emulates what Mark had in his hand during those uh, US shoots and at the same time allows you to have uh, electronics. Um, so if you want to do a static build in which this sliding switch is just for show, what you'll need to do is lightly sand just the top edge here so that when it slides in, it goes past um, this little lip. And that will hold it in place without any glue pretty firmly. If you want the switch to be able to move around to use as an electronic functioning yep. device, you're gonna have to sand this down a little bit more so that you can get enough clay um, to how you like it. I'll design a little bolt in there to fit so you can put a micro switch to activate it. Yeah, Hallowax has done a, a really good job already, actually, he's, he's quicker than I am. This is a 3D printed piece that I designed to fit inside of um, the Yuma control box to allow it to fit in the same setup as uh, the hero, right? So the design here is that um, you use this little tiny brass threaded insert that comes with the kit and heat it up, put it into the 3D printed section. Um, the heat will allow it to sink into the plastic part and then when it cools it will be a permanent threaded connection um, so you won't have to worry about stripping plastic or anything like that then that is screwed onto uh, this control box or i'm sorry on, onto the saber body with these little screws that i've supplied and then the yuma control box is screwed into the threaded insert um, using these little flathead screws. Um, and what I hoped people would do, the electronics guys, um, is make a much better version of this that allows for FX functionality, and that's exactly what Hallowax has done this past week. He designed a uh, 3D printed control box inner core that allows for it to be affixed as I originally intended, but then also allows you to use this second screw here, right? Which wasn't doing anything nope. um, as an activation button nope. to put a tactile switch underneath so that you can control. So you'll have two points of functionality. You'll have this little screw as a button to 
go on and off, and then you'll have this sliding switch um, as in the electronics control. Yep. All right, so we're gonna do the soldering iron trick here. And like Dan just pointed out, this should only go one way. So you wanna just test it, make sure the screw screws in. There we go, all right, so it's gonna go that way. Oh wow, that works quick. That's it, it's done. That's it. Wow. When it And when it cools, the metal, or I mean the plastic will have formed around all the little grips on there and it will be there permanently. Wow, yeah, it's nice and flush. Damn, that worked freaking perfect. Wow. Don't lose the little um, black screws that come with the control box. These are used, these are specifically low, low head, uh, low profile heads um, to give you more space in the Hero, but also they're designed to sit flush um, in the space here um, so that so that the uh, control box can be fit on snugly. Yeah, so in the, this, this, uh, what are we gonna call this part, this 3D printed part? The, the doohickey. The doohickey? Yeah. So, threaded insert goes here, screw puts the black printed part or white printed part if you get it from Shapeways in place. I believe this is a two millimeter Allen wrench I'm using. There we go. And then it is a little snug. It's a little bit snug, but that's great. Yep. Okay, so once this is all sanded, that hole will line up. Yep. Um, and then you use the provided um, flathead screw to screw this on, and then this one will allow for on and off, make use it as an electronic switch. Or if you're not using electronics, it's just cosmetic. It's just, yeah, it's just for show. I got a uh, 632 nut yep. screwed on the back there to hold that in place, so if you're not going to use electronics, you might notice that these holes are not centered um, to the box. They're slightly um, askew. That is, as best as I can determine, accurate to the Yuma pictures that we've seen. Yeah. Um, a couple of years ago, I was able to get a couple of pictures that I wasn't allowed to be made public, um, but I've looked at them and uh, Halowax has looked at them and I use them in designing this control box. Um, so this is my best approximation of how the saber looked when it was used as a fighting stunt saber um, when they were shooting the Java sail barge uh, sections of the film. No, I 100% agree with Starkiller that these were definitely off center like they are here. You'll notice that also that the Yumu control box is slightly longer than the hero. Um, I didn't notice that. Yeah, so that's what it looks like in the pictures to me. I see that the Yuma control box takes up the entire length of this, let's call it the clamp section, whereas the actual hero doesn't. The hero control box is shorter than the clamp section. Um, that led me to speculate, and this is just a maybe, that at some point when the saber was being um, reworked to go from being a fighting stunt prop to a close up insert shot hero, that what they might have actually done is taken the human control box and just sort of trimmed off the sides here yeah. um, when they were uh, machining out the inside. And so they might have actually controlled, the to, uh, they might have actually transformed this control box into this control box. I believe, I believe you're right on that because what are the chances of both sides, you know they're not symmetrical. Right. What are the chances of that happening again on the next that's, box? That's, that's, why, that's why I designed these angles to replicate um, each other. 100% agree on that. I did not notice that though. No. Another thing too that I want to bring up is uh, early speculation, I mean way back, if you go through the, the search function on the FBI, they always thought it was risen. Mm -hmm. And with those pictures, it's clearly not risen. Yeah, a while back, a lot of people were thinking that and I had a better blow up picture and wasn't able to post it, post it uh, 
publicly, um, but I remember sharing it with like people like Gino when he was working for EFX, and he thought it was a resin control box put on a aluminum hero, and then I showed him the picture, and he's like, oh god, no, you're totally right. Yeah, so if you do look on, on the old threads, which I tend to do a lot when I'm bored, I just go reading on old stuff, you'll you'll see that brought up, so don't con get confused that the original box was uh, risen. I think that might also be propagated by uh, a couple fake um, original props no, that people I... have been trying to sell in the past couple of years where they have machined aluminum bodies with resin control boxes that were cast off of the MOM Hero. But that doesn't make any sense because that control box wasn't made until those final inserts and then those castings were done after production. That's right. So you wouldn't have, the, the sequence wouldn't make sense to have a casting of the hero control box on the Yuma fighting version. No, I 100% agree with you. And we just saw one, another one surface quite recently, so yeah. it's kind of kind of upsetting that that's happened. But no, I agree. So why don't we try and modify this lever to get that to work? So if you just just the edge here, so that it doesn't all all that it needs to do is just not catch on the lip. Yeah, the little right? lip in there. I was curious how this was um, supposed to work. I didn't. I couldn't figure it out. When I printed that um, piece, I then realized, oh yeah, that's what the brass is used for. Right, and then as you insert it here, all you want it to do is go past that lip, and then if I push this harder, it will go in, snap in, and then it will stay. So it's kind of up to you if you want it. Do it. Go for it. There you go. There you go. And here you can tuck on it and you'll see that it's it's in there. Yeah, that sucker's not coming out. Yep. That's tolerance tight, boy. Now, if you want to use it as some sort of control switch, you'll obviously have to sand down the whole body of that. Yeah. That I like insert. that idea, though, of having the, the aux switch <clears> there. Yeah. I'll just work it and it'll... That pretty much covers the Yuma box. So let's clean this up and, and start working on the Hero. So when you get the Hero control box, this is gonna be the main part here. This is the 3D printed um, resin insert. Um, some of them might be a little bit bowed in the center due to curing. Um, that's not a problem though. Once you insert it and screw it down, yeah, nah. it will all fit into shape. Um, it comes with a little plate for your arrows. First off, Dan, I just want to say I was really impressed with everything that came with this kit. There's a lot of pieces for this kit. There are a lot of pieces. I didn't quite realize how many pieces there were going to be when I started like designing it, and then I was like, oh yeah, I gotta make that, and oh yeah, I gotta make that. Is this the most complex kit you've made so far? I mean, you showed me some stuff you have in the works, but to date, is this the most complex? Um. It's the, it's the one with the most small parts. Yep. Right? Little bitty, teeny weeny things that are quite a pain in the butt to find and source. Because um, it was made out of a lot of, it was made out of stuff that you could have gotten at a hobby shop in 1980 quite easily. Yep. Right? Tiny screws, little tiny plastic bits, um, arrow LEDs. Yeah. These arrow LEDs are impossible to find. Right? It's just, it wasn't a possibility to find original parts and to have enough of a source to create a run. So therefore, all of those arrows had to be cut. Yep. Right? All of them had to be um, manufactured from scratch. One thing you'll notice when you get this is these arrows are not centered. I, I picked up on that. I was really impressed with that. They're also off kilter. Yep. Right? They're not straight up and down. Um, that is a direct copy of how the arrows are situated on the original prop. If you want something idealized, you know, buy, buy another kit. <laughs> um, because this is supposed to be a warts and all. Sorry, I had it backwards. This is supposed to be a warts and all replica. Yeah. So this part goes here, and you'll see um, these screw holes line up. These are 080 screws. Wow, that's uh, tiny. They're quite tiny. If you are getting the next 30 kits that I'm shipping out on Monday, 
Those screws, unfortunately, will not be included in that shipment because my postman has lost 200 screws on me and I've been chasing them down all week. Uh, but don't worry, I gave up on that batch altogether and ordered from another different supplier that's gonna ship them UPS. Those 30 kits are gonna get shipped without the screws and then I'm just gonna throw them in uh, in envelopes and mail them to people, mail them to people. You've done that before in the past. Yeah, well, I live in New York City um, and shipping lightsaber kits from New York City is a pain in the ass. Um, it is not convenient to walk into a New York City post office uh, with, uh, with 50 boxes full of lightsabers. <laughs> they are not happy. How so, the hell do you get to the post office with that? Well, You're walking distance, right? I usually, what I, what I do, every once in a while I will ship something directly from New York, but usually what I do is I will go back to my folks' place in Connecticut wow. and do all the boxing and all of the assembly and then ship from a little tiny post office in middle of nowhere, Connecticut, where three people go throughout the day. So, so they don't- That much of a pain to ship out of New York. They don't, yeah, it's wow. that, I know it's that much of a pain that it's better to drive, you know, two and a half hours to Connecticut to get this stuff done. But when things happen, like I'm missing a couple screws, you can send me back a week. So that's why that small lot will be shipped in two different parts. Anyways, um, so the 080 screws go here. This is how it affixes um, when you have those screws. Another thing too, Dan, I just want to throw in there is you can get those screws in the orientation too. The the way they're slotted. Oh yeah. You can you can. I, I was fooling around with that the other day. This this one here just a little bit tighter than the other ones, but you can get them the same exact angles that's on the prop today. Yeah, it's a nice thing about like when you have tiny tiny threads like that. Is yeah. that like just a little tweak here or there? And I don't think you need to glue the plate down either. They were still fastened when I when I put them in yeah. the right orientation. Yep. No, yep, yep, they'll, they'll go right there. Um, so this insert, as I said, is meant to replicate um, the gluing it together with ABS and styrene that happened in the original prop. Which I think is a genius idea. When I saw that, I was like, wow. Yeah, it originally, I mean, it came from Brian and Adam because they had replicate, or they had designed a copper canoe to oh, fit in right. theirs. Um, but to a certain degree, having that copper part machined on its own um, would have jacked up the prices for this kit and also it's not how the original was constructed it was a plastic and um, metal construction on the inside so I wanted to try to replicate that um, so I created my own version of it um, you'll see it's hard to show and it's all in white right now um, but actually oh, this one here I painted I painted it in such a way so that we replicate the ABS here and then the styrene that's here crazy. that's on the original prop and then we will cut a length of this brass T-strip to around two inches, and that glues here. There's the cleaner side. And replicates the original control box and allows the card to slide back and forth. What's cool about this is how reliable it is, how you can get the slide back and forth, whereas in the original prop, they only needed it for that one scene to slide, mm -hmm. and then that was it. Like you said today, the thing's broken. Yeah, they've, they've so. sometime in the 80s, they definitely broke it. Um, this, the original prop has undergone quite a bit of wear in the past couple of years. I've seen it three times in person, I think. Um, and from the first time I saw it in maybe 2003 to the last time I saw it, I think last year ago, there's a, been a lot of paint loss. Uh -huh. You know, a lot, of, a lot of things have chipped off. It used to be displayed on its own um, and sort of set aside as an artifact. For the last couple of times it made, it, it was in the costume I noticed that, it's, it's in the mannequin's hands. Yeah, because the last display wasn't, it wasn't about so much the, the kit of Star Wars or the model making, it was, I think the, the, the tour was called like the art of costume. Yes. And so they were using it as dressing to highlight the costumes and therefore it wasn't taking center stage of its own. And I think to a certain degree that caused some of the paint loss. Um, so anyways, to back to the assembly, this is the 3D printed insert. You'll notice when you try to put it in at first, it's a tight fit. Don't just apply pressure, these are quite fragile. All you'll need to do is just sand here and here, right? Just a little bit on the edges um, so that there's so that there's no resistance. Be mine, mine took barely any sanding. Yeah, be careful. It's really only the bottom that you need to do. And you don't wanna, when you're going back and forth here with the sandpaper, you don't want to hit these because you don't want to leave sort of sand indentations here. Yeah. Um, I'll throw this model up 
every kit comes with it, but I'll also throw the model up on my website in case anybody ever needs to print out a replacement. No, that's um, a good idea. You can do it on Shapeways for like 10 bucks. Yep. Or if you have a resin printer. Yeah, if you, well, that's the dream. If we all have resin printers, we'll no longer have any problems. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of work, a resin printer. And that's it. Perfect. Got barely any sanding. Yep. And you see it fits there. And uh, when this part's in piece, it slides in there. There you go. Perfect. So here is the, con the Hero Control box mounted on the saver. Um, you'll see on the inside here, there are these uh, two square cutouts with two square holes on the outside. Your kit is going to come with two long tactile switches. And what it is designed for is for, sorry, big fingers, small holes. So these tactile switches will mount through here. You will push them down into these holes to get them to affix firmly. And then these will glue on here. You'll just put a little light dab. What I would probably do is some uh, brush on cyanoacrylate, the yep. brush on super glue, so you can control how much you get in the hole. Just either on like the absolute tip here or the end here. And then these will be your rocker switches that allow for electronics. Perfect. Perfect. There's barely, there's no modifications here. You just glue it on there yep. and it, it works. These are, uh, it's basically Del, uh, Delrin, uh, Delrin. I think the shop actually said it was P-O-M, which is a generic name for what Delrin is. So yeah. this very well is Delrin. It's a machinable plastic that goes high, that can go for high heats and um, high precision um, versus like a lot of your standard ABSs that wouldn't be able to get the type of finish that this material does. I didn't know that. Um, the holes here, or ever so slightly off center. Okay, so that's gonna, okay. And that allows, if you mount them so that um, they are closer to one edge and you put the closer, I almost can't even see it right now with my eyes, um, but you mount them here so that there's just a little tiny gap in the center. And so before you glue them, you gotta do a pre-run. Yeah. So the holes you want on the outer sides. The hole, what you want is the holes to be closer to the center oh. so that it mounts them with just a little bit of space in the inside. Yeah. Like that. Like that. Um, this is the Sloth Furnace card you will get from slothfurnace.com. He made these uh, ahead of time and did a fantastic job. He was able to replicate the blue um, substrata that was on the original card, which I don't think anybody else has been able to do so far. Um, it looks fantastic. I did a really, really pretty job he did. Um, he gave me the measurements, and so they fit just right here um, with enough room that it slides Perfect. quite nice, but it's not too loose. It's not going to fall out either. Yep. And uh, one of the amazing things about the card run that he did is... This is a vector board. It's an extension board from the 1980s meant to allow mainframes to hook together. Um, this is what I believe the original clamp card was made out of. Um, I was put onto this um, by Tom up in Buffalo. I bought a couple different versions of it. This is the one that I thought was closest to the original Hero Prop material. Um, when I got it, you didn't see copper. It was tin on top of blue substrata. Um, but uh, with this is from I don't know, 10 minutes of steel wool polishing, the tin comes right off, revealing a much uh, deeper and uh, more substantial copper underlay. And that's what I think the original was made out of. What I was really excited by was when I got this card, which was made independently of any of that information by Sloth, just using, you know, his, his, uh, photo manipulation and 3D modeling capabilities, which are incredible. Um, I put it right on here and it lines up perfectly. That's scary. That's scary. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's dead on. 
um, which further confirms my idea that oh, I believe it. You know that this is probably the original material. I mean, it's it's perfect. So, I guess maybe we throw the rails on there. Cut the rails. Throw the rails on. Yep. And um, then it'll be D ring. All right. So the things you're going to have to be doing in assembly of the the tough work is you're going to have to cut two two inch um, sections of brass L stock here. I've included about six inches, so you should have plenty of room, um, but measure twice, cut once. If you screw this up and you need a replacement, a lot of your local hobby shops are gonna have it. This is a uh, one eighth inch brass L stock from uh, K and S. Um, sometimes you can find it at Ace Hardware's. Lowe's um, has it. Lowe's has it? Yeah. Okay. A lot of the places by me, I had trouble finding it. And so I sourced as much of this as I, I could and I included the material. Um, you can also find it on eBay, although you know you might end up paying a little more than maybe you should, like once you yeah. get it shipped and everything. Um, and then the other thing you have to do is cut and then assemble this D ring. Um, the hole here is 530 seconds. The thickness of this D-ring is 964. So according to math, should fit no problem. However, um, when cutting a little bit of this section out of this part, sometimes you might have a little bit of flaring happen. Yeah. Right? Um, so you'll want to go over it with a uh, sanding bit on your Dremel to just make sure none of that is happening um, and so that it fits in smoothly before you're compressing it onto the saber. Now, the real prop, it looks like it's... Um, rusted? Well, no, well, it was rusted, but during filming, it's not rusted. Right. I was saying, that picture, when it's upside down, the triangle is vertical, right? So it's got a, a, a strong hold in there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. It's not supposed to jingling around. Yeah. I'm saying. When Master Replicas first made theirs, um, Steve was so like adamant that he didn't want the tri ring moving that he put a little um, pin right in the center of this pommel <laughs> cube in order to make sure that the tri ring are, always stayed straight and true. Wow. That always drove me crazy because I was like, yeah, why is there an extra pin, pin in the middle yeah. of my pommel cube for no good reason? <laughs> but for Steve, who was more on the engineering side, he was like, damn it, I don't want my tri ring flopping around. And we've never seen this hanging on a belt. No. It was never hung on a belt. No. I, and it actually, like, even when it was the Yuma, because of the way it lines up, it would be an awful thing to wear because this would be hanging on Mark's belt and this would be banging into his leg the entire time. Yeah. So as much as this is generally regarded as the Hero Saber, because it's the prettiest when it's cleaned up and because it shows up in the um, you know, Magic Myth book, the Lucasfilm Archives book, and because it's gone on tour, and it is seen in the close-up insert shot of, I see you have constructed a new lightsaber. That's a good impression. Thank you. <laughs> it uh, it really doesn't show up very much in the film. Almost every time you see um, the prop on Mark's Bell in the movies, it's the V2, and most of the time when he's fighting in the England shots, so that's going to be uh, Death Star and, well, that's our, um, that's gonna be the B3. Yeah. A lot of times people think that resin castings of this were used in the production of the film. Specifically, people think that a resin casting of the hero was what was shot out of R2-D2 in that first scene when the saber appears. Um, but that is actually not the case. The resin castings that were used during the production of um, the film were actually resin castings of the V3. Yeah. Resin castings were not made of this prop until after, after. the filming uh, the filming completed. Yeah. Um, because they had resin castings of the V3 for all the FX works because that had been made all the way back in 1977. Here, I'll grab my V3 so we can compare. Perfect. This is an exclusive. So this is my personal V3. Um, a couple years ago, I talked on the RPF about doing a project where I would use some measurements that I had from an original um, prop that a friend of mine owns and make a metal cast version of the hilt that replicated all the wonkiness, the um, pobble cubes on the bottom that are each differently angled and asymmetrical, as well as the big gnarly 
seam lines that run down the grip. Um, and I probably spent $1,500 to $2,000 working with companies in China to try to get castings made and they screwed it all up on me. I remember that. Eventually, I just gave up on the project and I did end up completing one of them by myself uh, by using my prototypes and um, by making uh, castings using a low temperature um, metal and silicon molds. Um, and was able to make one for myself, but it turned out just not to be a viable project to, for any sort of mass production. Let me tell it was you, far too labor intensive. You have matched the the color of that metal perfectly. Yeah, that's incredible. It is an ugly, ugly <laughs> lightsaber. Um, I put so much work into making it, and I gotta tell you, when I finished it off, I was like, ugh, that looks fugly. I have come to love it afterwards, though. But that's all. That's part of it. That's what it's, it's supposed yeah. to be. You know the redheaded stepchild it is it definitely is but the weight this thing's heavy yeah because this is not cast in aluminum this yeah. is cast in a basically pewter um but it's a low temperature metal that you can do like hobby castings um and so yeah it's heavy duty it, it, it's a skull cracker this is this <laughs> version this is the the lightsaber that went up into space in the mid 2000s uh lucasfilm donated the prop to NASA and they actually shot it all the way up in space. So now there's a little number right around here. That's what that number is for? Yeah, it was the cataloging number that NASA put because they were shipping things oh. to the International Space Station. It wasn't on the prop originally. It oh. wasn't on the prop before like, I don't know, 2005 or something like I that. I always thought that was it, Lucasfilm. Nope, that's NASA. No, sir. Yeah. That's even more history to it. So throughout the film, this was a fighting prop that they used in the England shots. This with the Yuma box on it was the fighting prop that they used in the American shots. I think they did have this in um, in some of the shots that you see in California. Redwood, in, in, yeah. yeah, the Redwood. Where they're fighting the speeder bike. Right. Um, but this was the one that was used in the Yuma shots. Um, and then resin castings of this um, were shot out of R2-D2. There's one that's still in the archives that has a big giant hole yep. drilled in the bottom. Yep. I think that's, you know, it's sat on an air compressor yep. and they shot, the, they shot the air in and then the saber flew out. The reason we know that it wasn't a casting of the hero or even a casting of the hero that had the emitter nub cut off is because of this neck groove. If you do, if you look at pictures of screenshots, yep. the neck groove appears in that, in that little shot. Um, oh, and so, and then resin castings of it with a nipple attached, because I think it might have been cast actually when it still had a blade in it. There's a little like vestige of a nipple on a V3 casting that Mark has that he stuffs into his belt when he jumps oh, onto, yes, 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 yeah. onto the uh, the uh, goes, sail barge, right? Yeah, where he goes, yeah. Right, when he's, when he's climbing up there. You can see that, and you can tell that it's a V3 specifically because you can see the neck groove and you can see this little hole in the clamp, yep. right? It was cast with the clamp on it. Although, actually, when it was cast, the clamp was a little bit farther towards, right now, the clamp is, as I put it, right against the booster. When it was cast for production, and you can see it in the Wired pictures, yeah. right? a couple years ago, Wired pu published some really high res pictures. The clamp was moved up all the way here. That creates this space here, and that's why this space here is on the hero. I agree with you completely. Right, because they were copying this and like came up with that little divot just because that's where the clamp was. If the clamp had been back here, you wouldn't have seen it. It's funny how things work like mm -hmm. that. Crazy. Thank you for sharing that with us. That's, <laughs> that's a piece of work. We were cutting the brass T-strip and we were cutting um, the tri-ring. So, I think rotary tool is the best thing you're gonna do. Um, if you try to cut the brass T-strip with a saw, you're gonna get a frayed end like this because this is really um, delicate material. So we have sort of the most delicate, finest blade we could find for the rotary tool to cut this brass T-strip. And then we're gonna use a little bit more of a heavy duty blade to cut the D-ring because this is obviously stronger and uh, tougher material. So we need to cut two lengths of this brass L stock. Uh, 1.965 is, is the number, right? So I basically have that here on uh, the calipers. 
and now I'm gonna measure it out and mark it with my Sharpie. So what I'm doing, I, I use kind of like a thick Sharpie, and then what I'm gonna do is just scratch to scribe the little line right there. Got this mounted in Halibax mice, which is very nice and nicely well protected with the gaffer's tape. Is this leftover V2 gaffer's tape? Oh, I got a shit ton of gaffer's tape. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I have, I have rolls of this myself in case anybody in New York City needs gaffer tape. <laughs> now what I'll do here is I will push this up and then I will go right to the end. Let know if I cut right on that line, I should have two equal lengths of brass. I usually don't have to go through this because what I like to do is just design the kits, send them out there, and then make Halawax here have to do all the uh, heavy lifting <laughs> and making sure these things actually fit together and troubleshooting when two ends of a Darth Maul lightsaber don't quite line up. Right? I know it's fun. Yeah, he handles he handles all the complaints. I, I got you working today. Though. Yeah. You're doing all the heavy work. Now, now I gotta put my money where my mouth is. <laughs> But that's basically it. Mm -hmm. And then these two get, I would, I'm gonna sand them a little bit. I'm going to hit them with some steel wool to make sure that everything's nice and clean on them. Then I'm gonna paint them. And then I mount them right here with, I think probably some two part epoxy. I'm gonna use a little bit of a, a five minute epoxy. So when I mount them, where'd my card go? I'm gonna put this in place here. Then I'm gonna run a little bit of two-part epoxy just on the outside of the white part. And then I'm gonna put this in place and hold it lightly on top of the sloth furnace card so that it still has enough play back and forth. That works great. Wicked. Here we're looking to attach the, um, the D-ring that we have mounted over here into this pommel cube. So, you see that at a minimum, pommel cube is 0.433, around 0.433. Um, so you want no bigger than 0.433 of a space here. Um, I'd probably go, I don't know, let's say a quarter of an inch or so, right? Because we're gonna widen, we're gonna open this up and then we're gonna close it back together. Um, but it, does, it can have a little bit of a play. And the original one is not symmetrical whatsoever. No, nothing, nothing in Star Wars. <laughs> nothing in the original Star Wars was. If I say like, what I'm looking to remove right now is just the weld that's in the center because I got to keep this separate. And also the weld in the center is a little bit thicker than the rest of the D-ring. So I kind of want to just cut that out. So I've marked off a quarter of an inch space. I'm going to cut it out of the center of the D-ring. No smoke alarms. Nope, we've been good. It's <laughs> 5.32nd and 5.32nd. So that's exactly the size of the hole. We want it to be a little bit smaller. And what that means is just removing the burrs that have been created. So do you have a sanding, little sanding drum for this? Yep. So what I've done is just rounded off the edges here so it won't have a problem going into the hole. Just grabbed a pair of needle nose pliers, put them here, and spread until it's big enough to get around the hole without any adverse reaction. Oops, one more. I 
Remember, this is made out of chrome steel. The hilt's made out of aluminum. So the pommel cubes are not gonna scratch the tri ring. Okay, and then I'm gonna close it up in the shop vise in order to get it. The only thing I'm worried about that I'm trying to be careful of is I don't want the shop vise to close on the other pommel cubes. So I've mounted the tri ring in here deep enough that the shop vise doesn't have a problem holding onto it, but not so deep that when I squeeze it, it screws up the other pommel cubes. tight tolerances that we're look, working with and these tri rings are mass produced in bulk not to be done not no. for these starts of purposes and so the plating is going to vary from one to another the weld that they because they're welded tri rings and so they're meant to be held together the weld is going to thicken up the metal just a little bit so it largely just means that you have to play with it um, What I've done is I took this little tiny sanding drum and just went around the edge to deburr it. I grabbed a 1.5 drill and just with my hands twisted in uh, the hole that is drilled in the Palmer cube to make sure that I'm removing all the burrs that would have been left over from the drilling. All you need is one. Yeah, I don't want to get in there with a power tool because that's when I'm getting up. And here's it mounted. There we go. Just take your time yeah. when doing that. You're gonna have to take your time because you can you can ruin things real quick. Yeah, which is not what we want to happen. Um, the cap. The body. Now I would recommend. Um, just to even out the finish. Um, it's a pretty good finish that we got from the machine shop, but before painting, I'd probably go over it with some fine steel wool, very, very fine steel wool. What is this? That's a uh, quadruple zero. Quadruple zero. And basically just sort of run it around the edges. This will take any amount of um, little burrs or something like that off and just sort of even out the finish a little bit. Um, there shouldn't be any sort of nicks or dings or anything like that. But because it's 6061 aluminum, um, some of the brush, you know, is always going to have a slight um, tell, right? Little tiny like marks um, that you could get out by just lightly going over uh, in like a circular fashion, right? To just even out the, col uh, the coloring of the aluminum. But that's not what you want the prop to be. It should be a brushed aluminum finish that yep. was the original. And, and you can clearly see that in the photos. Yeah. So the thing, what I'm looking to do right now is just basically removing watermarks, right? Removing like little tiny scratches that would have resulted just from chips from the machining itself. Yeah, I was under the impression reading through the old post that it was possibly painted silver to, to stop the glare in the sunlight. But that with those new pictures, it's clear as day yeah. that she's shiny. Yeah. She is shiny. Yeah. The, there, there was a silver resin version of this on display a couple years ago, um, and that went with this in the, I think like 1996 and 2001 Magic of Myth tour, but that is a resin casting that is painted silver, which I don't think was production used. Do, do we know where that is today? Because that's got the Back chrome tri ring on it. That has a chrome tri ring on it, and it also has um, the paint going up onto this section, which the hero doesn't. The hero does not have paint up here. No, it did when it was the Yuma. It okay. had it had a little bit of it had some black, I think, here actually when it was the Yuma. Yep. Um, but the hero it stops on this section, and there should be paint on the inside. Here. Okay, that's where I was confused. Yep. Yeah. So the risen one, this is actually painted. Yeah. Uh, the oh. whole this this lip right here oh, wow. is painted. Um, yeah, like a lot of times when people have the kits where they're they come apart. 
a really easy way to paint this section, or if it's made out of copper, right, you will see this section painted separately. On the master replicas, it's painted separately. But when you do that, you lose the paint on the inside, yep. um, which should be there. Yep. Wow. Um, and so a couple people have asked me about machine marks in between the pommel. Did I mention that? We haven't talked about that yet. So you'll see there's a little bit of a swirling uh, in between the pommel cubes here. Some people have asked me, how do I get rid of that? Um, you could, if you want an idealized version of it, go over it with a little bit of um, Scotch-Brite um, or steel wool, um, and that will take out them. They're not very deep, but I personally would not do that. I would leave them because when I saw the original prop, when it was on display in the Bronx a couple years ago, they were very, very visual up close. You didn't see them too well in the pictures because the lighting is always really bad in those places. But I distinctly remember that there were uh, tool marks that I could see with my eye. Um, and the reason I remember taking such notice of it is because like a week before I had been working on a lightsaber that I bought on the RPF and I had spent the whole week trying to remove all of the <laughs> machine marks from those pommel cube recesses. And then I brought my lightsaber to the Magic Myth exhibit because I wanted to see how it compared and I wanted to smack myself that I had spent the whole week <laughs> removing those machine marks and there they were on the original. Mm. So That's how it always works. Yep. That, that pretty much sums up the whole assembly of yep. the Yarrow. After that, it's just, uh, just painting. Yeah. Give it a good soak in uh, some acetone, remove all the uh, oil on it and mask it up and paint it up. Right, so that concludes uh, the steps by Dan, the creator of this kit. I just want to thank Dan for coming out here. Thanks for having me. I uh, finally got to meet the creator and uh, it was a long trip. I really appreciate you coming out here, man. I appreciate right. the friendship and uh, I hope to do this again. Yeah, we had a blast. Thanks a lot, man. This is Hallowax and Starkiller out. Woo! <laughs>